Come on, welcome to Rivers Crossing. Who's glad to be in church today? Well, we're going to worship our great God today. Come on, put those hands together with us. When the battle rages on. When the battle rages on. Well, the victory is won. If the king can dance before.
this time we're going to take communion together. Um, the communion cups are in the cup holder of the seat you're in. And uh, we take communion together a lot as a church family, and I love it every single time that we do. And uh, every time that we do this together, we've taught a lot on it. There's a lot of depth biblically and scripturally in what's happening in this moment. There's a lot of theological implications. And, but today I was reminded just of the simple truth that communion, this, this bread and this cup was what Jesus said to do to remember him. It's the tool that he gave us to look back 
on the moment where he stepped in as the substitution for what we were supposed to take on ourselves. I was supposed to have to die for my sins, for the wages of sin is death, but because of his grace and his mercy extended to me in the act of the cross of Calvary, he paid it for me. And then he sat at a table with his 12 disciples and they had the Passover meal and he spoke the words, as long as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. So he gave the church this act right here as our way to look back in gratitude that he took my place. So I pray that as we take communion today that you, you would take the words of Jesus with a little bit of extra added weight today in what it is that we're about to do together. We're looking back on a moment where he's saying, I'm about to go pay for your sins. And I just ask that you remember that I did it and accept that I did it. The word says that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, as long as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. You can take that top layer back. And let's take the bread together. And then he took the cup, the cup which represented a, a new covenant, a better covenant in his blood. And in the same way, he said, take this, and as, anytime that you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Lord Jesus, we remember the act of the cross. And Lord, I... I cannot thank you enough. There's no word I could say. There's no life I could live. There's nothing I could do to measure up to it or to fully express what it did for me. But purely, Lord God, I just say thank you and I commit to living my life in remembrance that you took my place. And I thank you so much, Lord God, that because of it, I have salvation and get to spend eternity with you. It's in your name we pray, amen. Amen, let's continue to worship together. Lord, I thank you for the blood. I thank you for your sacrifice. Everything you've done for me, freely given without spite. Thank you for your love It's not reserved for perfect hearts The love that covers all of me You've given from the start I thank you for the cross The price you chose to pay On a hill where love would die It was perfect love displayed I'll forever sing this truth Spare my life and yours was lost I praise you for your mercy And I thank you for the cross Thank you, Jesus Matchless in pursuit Your decision never sway That day you gave it all for me You offer me your heart So I'll follow your every lead Just to be right where you are Oh, I thank you for the cross The price you chose to pay On a hill where love would die This perfect love to say I'll forever see
Lord, I thank you for salvation. I thank you for eternity. Yeah. Shouldering my every sin, you carried up to Calvary. And how even with all I've done, you welcome me with open arms. So gladly I'll give everything, but I cannot give. Come on, lift your hands, lift your voices and sing. Gladly I'll give everything, but I cannot give the cross. Yeah. I thank you for the cross, the price you chose. church today before you take your seats turn around say hello just greet somebody today man 
what a powerful, powerful moment of worship there. It's awesome. If I haven't met yet, my name is Brandon. So excited that you are here with us today. If it's your first time joining us, uh, thank you. Uh, we wanna give you a gift as our way of saying thank you for being here. And so after the service, head out to the lobby. There's a big flag out there uh, that says new here on it. Uh, go there and someone from our team would love to meet you. Uh, let you know how you can get involved here at Rivers Crossing and also send you home with a free gift. Again, our way of saying thank you for being here. If you don't follow us on social media, uh, please do, Instagram, Facebook. Also download our app, uh, the RC app. You can do that in any of the app stores and it is a great resource, a great tool for you uh, to, you can listen to past messages, past sermon series. You can uh, follow along and do sermon notes. Uh, you can also keep up with what's going on around the church, different events and things like that. Uh, one of which I'm super excited about, we're kicking it off today, and that is the Rivers Crossing Summer Tour that we have planned for you guys this summer. The next three months, it's gonna be action-packed. It's gonna be the best summer yet, no doubt, and we are excited about it. It's gonna be tons of events for you and your family, uh, opportunities to serve our community, uh, and of course, some incredible sermon series that we have planned, getting it kicked off today with Preach It. And uh, so it's gonna be great. And we have a ton of events. I think we have a slide up here that lists some of the events up. Yep, it's gonna be awesome. So before you leave today, uh, you're gonna get a card that has all of that on it. So you can hang it up on the fridge and be reminded of all that's going on this summer. You can also check out our website with all of those details as well. Well, like I said a few seconds ago, today we're kicking off one of my favorite series, Preach It. And we have an incredible message in store for you. So let's meet our guest speaker. What's up, Rivers Crossing? Pastor Paul Taylor here. I'm the lead pastor here at Rivers Crossing. And if you're a guest, we're so honored that you're here with us today. Honored to have you in the house for one of my favorite series of the year called Preach It, where we have our friends, church planning partners, and world-class communicators come and share every summer while I'm on study break. And today you're in for a special treat. Mo Isom Aiken is a New York Times bestselling author, uh, including her book, Jesus, Sex, and the Conversations that the Church Forgot that Farrah and I read as we prepared earlier this year for Shame Free Sex. And we fell in love with Mo's story. She was an All-American goalkeeper in the greatest conference in the land, in the SEC at LSU, Go Dogs, Mo. And we're so honored that she said yes to come speak to us this summer. Her and her husband, Jeremiah, have four kids and they travel the country in an RV doing ministry all over the US and the world. And let's uh, just stand to our feet and give a warm welcome to Mo Isom Aiken. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good afternoon, people of God. Good afternoon, it's noon. Yes. We told our friend the other day, we were doing the three services and the last one was at noon and he was like, who goes to church at noon? I said, me, if I had the choice. It's a good thing. Also, it is such a pleasure and an honor for us to be here. My husband, Jeremiah, um, and myself and our four kids. We have, let's see, a seven-year-old, a five-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old. Um, and about a year and a half ago, we fully mobilized on mission for the gospel, um, sold our house and our stuff, got a fifth wheel RV. Do we have any RVers? Say it loud and proud. Okay, thank you. Every service, it's gone up one hand. The first service, it was one singular person that seemed embarrassed to admit it. Now we've got four people. This is, these are my people. We uh, travel the country full time in a fifth wheel RV and uh, are led by cloud and fire, go where the Holy Spirit directs, say what he instructs us to speak. And so this is just a privilege to be with you guys. Mostly it is restorative and redemptive to our hearts because we were racking our brains a couple days ago. Have we ever been to Ohio before? And then we remembered we had one time we'd been to Toledo in the winter and we said, there's nothing for us here. We will never be back <laughs> to Ohio. This has been a very redemptive trip. We have so enjoyed our time here. Uh, in Columbus here and, and uh, even drove down into Lexington yesterday to be with the family. 
We just love your leadership, uh, Pastor Paul, Pastor Farah. We appreciate them so much. And it's a gift to be with you guys. I want to preface, you're about to get blasted in the face by a fire hose of information. So if you're a note taker, get your wrist ready. Um, if you feel like that will distract you, I am sure they will put this up on YouTube. So just sit and receive. Just receive what the Spirit of the Lord wants to impart where I want to take you guys today is a deep dive the Lord led me through for two plus years. And we get to just do like the 30,000 foot flyover, but it transformed my understanding of an angle and a layer of the character of God that I couldn't actually previously healthfully receive. And what I mean by that is, um, oh, you looked like one of my coaches from high school. I said, did he come here to Cincinnati? Sorry, you caught me off guard. What I mean by that is <laughs> I believe we are in a spiritual hour where the fullness of God uh, is being indwelled, where he is desiring his people to receive the fullness of who he is. Many of us may know him as friend, but we struggle to follow him as master, as Lord, right? Many of us may know him as father, but we struggle to receive revelation of his kingship and kingdom, right? We all kind of have unique ways based on our life and our experiences that we are more apt to receive revelation of Christ and then other areas that he has to open our eyes. He has to give us understanding because just like maybe a relationship with a friend or a spouse, we are all multifaceted. So is the heart of God. So is the spirit of God. So are the ways that he will speak to us. And a huge piece that I needed healing and revelation of was who he was as bridegroom. That's all through the text. It refers to Christ as bridegroom, the church as the bride, right? But I remember I was, the Holy Spirit brought to my heart uh, a few years back, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. And that scripture says, not all who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, well, did we not prophesy? Did we not perform miracles? Did we not cast demons? To them, I will say, away from me, I never knew you. And that scripture to the carnal mind can seem scary. But there are times the Holy Spirit is going to illuminate something to you. And you can't let a perverse spirit of fear attach itself. You have to be willing to wrestle with the spirit of truth for revelation of the heart of God. And as I wrestled in this, I'm saying, okay, so really what these people are arguing back, they were doing mighty and powerful works. They were casting demons. They were prophesying. They were seeing miracles come to pass. Yet the will of the Father was not associated solely with their works. The will of the Father was an intimacy, was a knowing and a being known. And that translation of the word new, as it, it translates um, the Hebrew idiom around that phrase is yada, yada intimacy. And it's used in the same context many times throughout the word, uh, but a couple examples would be like, and Joseph had not yet known Mary. And the man took his wife and he knew her. It is the all-encompassing, vulnerable, transformative, husband, wife, intimacy that we think of. And this was what the Lord, many times in the Old Testament, he's saying, I desire that my people will know me. And it's this same translation. It's this oneness, transformative oneness. We understand that in the natural marriage to become one, right? Physically, mentally, emotionally. They grow in unity with one another. This too is the heart of the gospel. And so I said, okay, I, I, can, I can appreciate that, I can get that, <clears throat> but if I'm real, when I was looking around at my life and my own experiences, I didn't have a ton of pictures of healthy intimacy. In fact, to associate intimacy with the gospel felt perverse to me. 
It's not because God, the very maker of intimacy, is perverse in any way. It's because what the enemy has twisted and distorted and used many times as a weapon in my life are the ways I, in my carnal desires, had operated in intimacy. That's what caused the fracture. And so I just want to start by saying uh, it's one of, it could be a whole separate sermon series, but it's one of the enemy's primary works against you. And it starts from the earliest age. Many of us have different stories, different testimonies around uh, the sexual component of our lives that hold a lot of dynamic pieces. My family, the marriage that I looked to as a direct picture when I was in college, my dad put a gun to his heart and pulled the trigger. Suicide entered my story, and suddenly you wanted to talk to me about a love that would remain and abide and fight for us. There was a disconnect. The same father, through him, I had been exposed to pornography at nine years old, dealt really with an addiction until the Lord delivered me at 19. My understanding of intimacy was very marred that way. And even though I was very good at wearing a mask and faking fine and seeming very self-righteous in my vain virginity vow, the boundaries that I pushed behind closed doors and the sexual promiscuity I operated in, in dating, in relationships, in college, all of those things worked together to seriously distort my understanding of healthy intimacy. And your story may hold different things, but the weapons of warfare are the same. So I said, God, if you're trying to reveal another layer to me of bridegroom, you have to teach me. Like we have to start from scratch because I have a lot of preconceptions and probably many of them and those wounds are actually keeping me from you if we're honest. And he said, perfect. I think the Holy Spirit delights when we willingly and humbly ask him to teach us. He is a teacher Yeshua himself, Jesus, rabbi. This is a component of the Holy Spirit and he's looking for teachable, humble hearts. So I said, you gotta teach me. And when I dove in head first to that journey, what he used to reveal to me the depths of his heart, what prophesied the gospel in a new and fresh way, and what renewed my mind in understanding in my own spiritual walk was that he utilized the ancient Hebraic wedding. What I mean by that is the wedding, the marriage context in the very culture that Jesus was ministering. We often read the words and we're reading these parables and there's so many references to this all through the scripture and we're like, This is so mysterious and elusive. Really, it wasn't to the people at the time. Jesus was constantly giving keys, giving connection words, right? Constantly making connections for them in their carnal understanding to reveal to them the kingdom. And so he said, then I want you to study marriage as I was speaking to it. So I did, I deep dove, and I hope y'all are ready to geek out with me. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to move in power. We welcome you to speak. We welcome you to open ears, to open eyes. We welcome you to bring revelation. We welcome you to teach and to bring understanding. Lord, I pray that as your word goes forth, you would draw all unto yourself. Lord, that it would not return void, but would return back to you with harvest, God. I ask that the seeds that are scattered as we look to your word would find good soil. We trust you. We bless you. We worship you because you are good. Thank you that you are bridegroom. Give us understanding of who we are as bride in Jesus' name. Amen. So it's very cool. The Hebraic wedding was multi-part. The first part was known as the betrothal. And it had many pieces and elements that were gonna fly over here. And then there was a period of time and then there was the wedding feast and the consummation, the completion of the marriage. And so the first element is so powerful to me. I feel like you could sit in it for a year's time receiving the wonder of his grace. But the first element, and I'm often in this time, if you just want to make a note, going to reference Genesis 24, where Abraham sends a servant to retrieve a wife for his son Isaac, Rebecca. The first component in this is it began with the father's choice. 
The father chose the bride for his son. We see this when Abraham sent the servant to go in accordance with the word from the Lord to retrieve a wife for Isaac. We see this in the story of Hosea and Gomer. It'll be the prostitute who is your bride. It's the father who would choose the bride for the bridegroom. Now we see this supported in the scriptures too, John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Deuteronomy 14, 2, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the people who are on the face of the earth. But perhaps this concept, and it's many, many scriptures tied to this, but is most simply summarized in 1 John 4, 19, we can love because he loved us first. It's almost that the grace of God is needed for us to even grasp for the grace of God. God has been at work in your life and in your story since before you even had awareness and revelation of your need for him. I can think back and see ways that the spirit of God was at work, utilizing people, utilizing circumstances, even some that seemed traumatic, come out of victim mentality, and understand the righteousness and sovereignty of God that he himself reserves the power to use all for your good and for his glory. The suicide of my father, I don't delight in it, but my God didn't waste a piece of it for his glory. And so the grace of God, the work of the spirit, is it work over your life because you're even here. Some of you might be here because you were at a graduation and your family member was like, come to church with me this morning. And you're like, well, it needs to be the noon service if we're doing that. And so we're here now. But the fact that you even care, the fact that you're even leaning in, the fact that you're wrestling with, is this existence just carnal here? Is there more? What does it mean? The kingdom concepts, the spirit, that is the spirit of God at work, the grace of God, and I pray you see his outstretched hand. You're not an accident, a mistake. You're not here by some happenstance. The father chose the bride for his bridegroom. The next component was the proposition, the proposal that the bridegroom would make to the bride. It's so profound to me. Because what we're formed by in this dating culture is the identification of the best possible perspective and do they make me happy and can they serve me and do I have the fire, the flame? And so we live in this presumption of it's not all bad, but the idea that we must make ourselves worthy and valuable, that we might be chosen. Let's be very clear. We knew oneness with the Father in the garden, Adam and Eve, the epitome of his creation. The bait of Satan, the lie of the adversary was he might be withholding something from you. Choose for yourself what is best for you. You could be like God. And it looks like this invitation to autonomy. It looks like the invitation to freedom. But every form of sin is a false freedom presenting itself to you. And the fruit is that rather than being free to live as we please, steward our bodies and our lives as we want, the reality is that we be trafficked into a brothel and we become enslaved to sin. That's what the deceiver is regularly and rhythmically carrying out in our lives. And so we're trafficked into a brothel, enslaved to sin, heck, born into iniquity. We only know the kingdom of darkness. The ruler in this time over this physical world is the adversary himself. And we are born into this household. I can testify it didn't matter our socioeconomic status, my athletic successes, my grace, nothing. I knew the fruits of the kingdom of darkness. Depression, anxiety, promiscuity, justifying sin, rationalizing sin, prettied on the surface, but my soul was dead, crying out, my spirit. 
And here's what's so amazing. We hear the scripture in Genesis often at weddings, and it's beautiful. You can use it at weddings. Weddings are a, a, a shadow, a picture of the gospel, right? But we hear, and the man leaves his father's house and retrieves of his bride, and the two become one flesh, and together they are naked and unashamed. This is beautiful for marriage, but this was a prophetic declaration of the work of the gospel. Because Jesus left his father's house in the heavenly realm to take on flesh like us, fully God, fully man, to walk a sinless life, to give of his life in order for the bride of Christ, the church of Christ, to be made manifest. Just a hiatus for anybody who's a nerd like me. Remember Adam in the garden? Where did God draw Eve from? From his rib. When Christ hung on the cross and was completing the work of all authority, where did living water and the blood of Christ flow from when he was pierced? He was pierced in the rib. As woman was drawn from Adam, the church was drawn from Yeshua, was drawn from Jesus. And his work leaving his father's house was to retrieve of his bride and by faith, when we receive of that sacrifice made on our behalf, we become unified with him. And the very work of the gospel is that this intimacy, this oneness would leave us not hiding behind our fig leaves and our sin and our shame, but would leave us naked and unashamed. Not standing before the Lord in the end with fear, but as the word says, having been perfected by love. That work of transformation occurs when we recognize the very work of the gospel was to reconcile what was broken but always meant to be oneness with the Lord. And so the proposal is amazing to me because Jesus came and completed that work and in every sense, it was a busting down of the brothel doors because he held the keys and all authority by his blood and by his name, a reaching into the darkness and a drawing us out into his glorious light. We served with a ministry called Natalie Sisters in Lexington. It positions itself on the busiest street of prostitution in the city to serve the women who are look like they're walking free, but they're sexually enslaved. I don't know what I envisioned. With all due respect, the condition of these women when they came were nothing like porn makes it look, were nothing like Hollywood makes it look, were nothing like the lying spirits of lust make you think about. It was horrific. They looked like the walking dead, and they didn't even realize they were enslaved. In the physical. Be aware that's the same condition he found me in, in the spirit, and you too if you were in sin. It wasn't a pretty, proper, and now I would love to make a covenant of love with you. Will you be mine? Imagine what we could be. He found us destitute. And in that place, he proposed a covenant by his blood. Will you be mine? I'll be yours. Receive me by faith. I'm the way and the truth and the life, and I love you. I love you. I couldn't make sense of it when I first came to believe. I was addicted to pornography. I was sexually promiscuous. I was depressed. I was anxious. I was prideful. I was an amazing liar. I was full of gossip. I was a manipulator. I knew the fruits of the work of the kingdom of darkness. And yet he rescued and said, I forgive it. Now follow me. Mary Magdalene, seven demons cast out, I can relate. Deliverance is the portion for the believers and it's more powerful when you recognize how badly you need it. And he is our great deliverer. The third component of the Hebraic wedding ties into this, it was that a bride price was paid. Now many people hear that and they're like, that's so demeaning and to the woman, yada, yada, we're not property. No, 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 let's be so clear. The standard at the time in the surrounding nations was that you raped a woman and she became your property. 
So what God instituted amongst his people was a dignifying, worth assigning. You are of value. I will make sure it is evident that the bride was valuable to her household and the bride price blesses them because I recognize there is something of value. Think about that. Read Genesis 24. The servant lavished Rebecca's family in gifts and blessings when she said yes to come with them. What is the bride price that Christ Jesus paid on our behalf? Though tempted, tested, and tried in accordance with Matthew 4, 1 through 11, Jesus yielded himself completely to the point of death, Philippians 2, 5 through 8, living a sinless life and giving up his life by the shedding of his blood in order to be the pure, holy, and perfect atoning sacrifice for our sin. In doing so, in accordance with 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, Christ became our bride price. Do you remember when Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees in John 8, 37 through 47? What did he say to them? It's a key. You're a liar like your father, the devil. He called them children of Satan. He was speaking to the kingdom and the household that they refused to, by faith, break ties with. In our sin, that was our heritage. But by the blood of Jesus and by the name of Jesus and by the legal jurisdictions in the spirit realm, the bride price that Christ paid is perfect. Satan can't do a thing about it. I don't care if you've lived 50 years in the kingdom of darkness. I don't care if you've, oh my goodness. We ministered one time in Wales and a woman was beginning to receive deliverance and wanting to receive Christ by faith. And she said, I just don't know. I just don't know if your Jesus could really receive me. She was in her mid-60s. She'd been a madam in a brothel for over 30 years, trafficking women herself, did jail time for the pimp over her, because everybody answers to somebody. And she said, I just don't know because I stopped counting the number of sexual partners that I personally had been with at 10,000. You are without excuse because if the grace of God is enough for her, today it is enough for you. Even at the name of Jesus, she was receiving deliverance. This is what the bride price enacts. If they will take of my hand, There is nothing that can stop me from pulling them out. That was done for us. I couldn't believe it. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends, or it brings it into better clarity in 1 Corinthians 7, 4, that a husband give over his body for his wife. Christ gave of himself for his church and paid the bride price powerfully. The next element of the betrothal process was known as the mikvah, and it was a ritual immersion. It had to be done in living, flowing water, which, okay, hello, prophetic connections. And it was a cleansing, quite literally, physically, but it was a symbolic act of the old self as individuals gone, raising up into the new union of betrothal. It it signified new identity, new authority. What does this prophesy? Water baptism. It was a part of the betrothal process. And we see too in the word in Matthew 3, 13 through 17, Christ was immersed in water. We are welcome to be baptized, immersed as a spiritual proclamation. The old is gone, the new is come. I knew who has paid the bride price for me. But even continually, Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, we too are continually immersed by the washing of the word. I pray you all shower regularly in the natural, yes? So too spiritually, you should be regularly engaging in the mikvah. Wash me with your word. Just as Jesus washed his disciples' feet, cleanse me. Purify me. Let me continue to proclaim my identity in you, the authority of you. 
Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. The mikvah is such a beautiful piece of the process, and the continual invitation to be renewed is available to us through the word. The next element was known as the ketubah. My sister married a man who is Jewish by culture, by birth, and it was amazing. At their wedding, there was literally a ketubah. I was like, this is wild to me because this is real. It's right here. And they're like, of course. The ketubah was a binding written agreement. Think like a contract. There's power in the written word. We know this in accordance with Matthew 4. The ketubah solidified the betrothal. And it was a five-part document that directly aligns with the first five books of the Bible. The Torah, the beginning of your scriptures, were a marriage covenant being extended to you. This has been sitting on your bedside table collecting dust because you open it and you just read by the letter and you're not praying, Lord, reveal this living, breathing word to me in spirit and in truth. Because if you try to read much of this word without the spirit giving revelation, it's like, what's up with Leviticus? And they're telling them rules about not doing stuff with livestock. What were these people doing with their lives? No, no, no. <laughs> it's bigger. <laughs> Genesis, the first part of the ketubah, was a detailed account of the origin and family history of the bride and the groom. This is Genesis, the account of our creation. The next element of the ketubah was the history of the bride, her family. This is Exodus, the history of God's people. The next element was the history of the groom. This is Leviticus and the Levites and the Levitical priesthood. The next element was how the bride and groom met. This is the book of Numbers and God's relationship with his people in the wilderness and his pursuing love. And the fifth part were the duties of preparation. This is Deuteronomy, the law of God, the requirements but we know too by the blood of Jesus, Hebrews 8, 6 comes to life, that but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is a much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. This marriage covenant, this contract, is extended and available to each and every one. And by his blood, we come into that covenant under his grace by faith. But what's cool to me is that with the ketubah, there's a whole layer that I don't even have time to dig into that was a part of the process with the drinking of various cups. It's why he says, I will not drink of this cup again until the wedding feast. So the agreement in this element, the bridegroom, the man, was contractually obligated. In his agreement to the ketubah, it was binding. To depart from it would need a decree of divorce. The bride, on the other hand, continued to have the free will. She made her commitment, and we'll get to another step solidifying her commitment. But until the completion of the marriage ceremony, the bride could choose. Does she get distracted? Does she get deceived? Is she making herself ready? But be very clear, the groom was bound. And so just a word for somebody today. When we, and these are words that came from my lips 12 years ago, so I'm with you. When the words come out of, I don't feel like God is near. Does he hear me? Does he love me? I don't know if the character of God, he this, 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 this. The enemy wants you to just yoke every ill and false identity on your heavenly father. Be very aware that the word of God says he cannot lie. He is the very spirit of truth, that he will not leave you nor forsake you. So if you have come into faith in Christ and you feel at some season like, where is God? It is not because he has strayed from the covenant. It's probably because you have. And he pierced me with that one day. He said, you, you say you love me with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. 
yet you still have an adulterous heart. Chasing after my own will, my own wants, idols, thoughts, the plans of the world. No, no, no. He's made covenant. And just as Hosea continued to pursue Gomer, he's not going anywhere. But you have a choice to make, to choose this day whom you will serve, whom you will abide in, whom you will come home to. Ketubah is powerful. The next element was the bride's dowry. And this was <laughs> essential to the equation because she had to choose. It's her element of the commitment to the ketubah, really. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. And he will sit with him and he with me. I will eat with him and he with me. You have an invitation. You have an invitation. The bride had to agree. But in doing so, in saying yes to relationship with Jesus and saying yes to this process with the bridegroom, a bridal dowry was to be an equivalent gift in accordance with the bride price paid. What could possibly be equivalent in our lives to the power of what Christ did for us? The appropriate bridal dowry, and I will call anyone and everyone out if you looked me eye to eye. If this day you profess Christ as Lord, the only appropriate measure that is a standard of God Almighty is your fully yielded life. He says, I don't want you hot or cold. You're lukewarm. I will spit you out of my mouth. You are in the world, but you are not of it. He reminds the disciples, make sure you counted the cost to following me. Because in this world, you will face trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world. Yield your life completely. The word submission has been so abused and twisted and just triggered 48% of you guys. But submission in the Latin is submitir, to come under the sending. Submission with a fully yielded life to Christ is to actually say, you know the plans and purposes for my life. You know every hair on my head. You know who you knit me together to be. You know what is ahead. You see beginning from end, I am yielding myself to you. Let your thoughts become my thoughts. Your heart become my thought, my heart. Your ways become my ways. Where you tell me to go, first time obedience, I will follow you. What you tell me to speak, first time obedience, I won't fear man, I won't fear rejection, I won't fear any that comes with why we, uh, uh, we tiptoe around. <laughs> Aunt Debbie didn't like my scripture post. So you take it down, give me a break. <laughs> I don't know about you, but he might have rescued me from brothel state, but he's made me daughter of the most high king, armored in the full armor of God, engaged in the process with him. You no longer will tiptoe and teeter around life. You will know oneness with the spirit of God to say your will, not my own, just as Jesus uttered in the garden of Gethsemane before he took the cross. Your will, not my own. And that will mark your life, your bridal dowry will be pleasing to the heart of God. I'm getting a little feisty. I'm sorry, it's the third service. I was so gentle the first service. You're my girl right here down front. The next element was the matan. I will really geek on this one. The matan were the gifts left before departure. Departure, what do you mean? Well, let's see the word of God come to life. The literal function of this union was after all of these steps had been completed, the bridegroom had to literally go to his father's house to build on a room for he and his bride to eventually dwell in. Not even the bridegroom himself would know the day or the hour when the father said, okay, it's complete, it's good, go and get your bride. We went to Israel. 
We were in a neighborhood having a meal with a family. This neighborhood outdated America. These homes were old, yet so many of them seemed to have new construction going on. They said, don't you know? Many soon will be married here. Many young, young ones are soon to be married. They were adding on physical rooms to the Father's house. Please throw up the scriptures. John 14, one through seven, Jesus himself, before he ascended unto the Father, said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, because I, the bridegroom, am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him because we saw Christ incarnate. Christ was speaking to them and they could understand. It was the context. He's going to prepare a place In Mark 13, 32 through 33, but concerning the day or the hour, no no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. Jesus is even still waiting for the Father's word. But he's prepared a place for us, and the gift he gave before departure, someone, what did he say to the disciples? I'm ascending. Go to Jerusalem, wait, I'm sending you a gift. The helper, the Holy Spirit, the baptism by fire, the matan, the gifts at departure that Jesus poured out upon the 12, have poured out upon all flesh is the fire baptism of the Spirit of God. We must receive that by faith, it is a gift. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you believed in him. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we come into possession of it, to the praise of his glory. He gave the gift of the Holy Spirit, paved the way for the Spirit to come, with the guarantee of our inheritance, that we could know that we know that we know who our Messiah is, that we could know that we know that we know that our King is the King above all kings. Because the Holy Spirit was given for the next part of the process that was known as the Kiddushin. That is the very spiritual time we're in right now. Jesus at the right hand of God the Father, the Spirit poured out, the Kiddushin time period was the time of preparation. Where the bride would prepare herself and make herself ready. Here's what's so amazing about the Matan. It's not a single gift. God is a multiplying God. So the Spirit of God at work in you has many functions. First and foremost, He is there to sanctify you, to make you like Christ, to deliver you, to heal you, to teach you, in accordance with 1 Thessalonians 5, to sanctify you completely, body, soul, and spirit. To leave you without blemish. But we are so used to quenching the Holy Spirit that one of his primary functions of conviction, we don't know how to receive his mercy. We're like, that hurts my feelings. Well, I'm sorry, Donna. I'm so sorry. (laughs) I don't know if there's a Donna in here. No offense. I have to be really careful when I throw out names. I have a hilarious story I don't have time now to share, but sorry, Donna. The point is, (laughs) if you have heard a false gospel and been lied to, that the, the gospel of Christ is equivalent to praying a prayer one time and then you live your life as you please, you need to come out of the spirit of error. Because the gospel of Christ is that the spirit of God is poured out by the work of the cross, 
by the blood of Jesus, all that we've talked about is enacted. And now here in this Kiddushin time, we know the ebb and the flow. The ebb back is that I allow the spirit of God to work things out in here. Convict me of my sin. Set me free. Transform me. Comfort me. Counsel me. It says he will remind us of everything Jesus spoke. Be my teacher. Be my rabbi. Let me know the hidden place with you that I might have experiential victory so that then when it's time to flow out, I can do so with authority and power. Because the spirit of God in the hidden place will begin to bear the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And then he will send you out and that's where that gift ninefold, word of knowledge, word, I'm really feeling lax up here, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, discernment of spirits, miracle, prophecy, tongues, interpretation of tongues, gift of supernatural faith. All of these things are intended that we be able to operate in when we go out to say, do you know there's a wedding feast coming? All with ears to hear. The least and the lost and the hurting and the enslaved. Do you know that there's a bridegroom who wants to be one with you? We're intended to evangelize. Your form of evangelism cannot simply be, oh, come to the church on Sunday. Pastor Paul can tell you dot, dot, dot. No. You have the spirit of God in you. You should be operating in the gifts of the spirit. You should be teaching. You should be opening eyes. You should be, Spirit of God, give me a word of knowledge for this person. And constantly praying without ceasing. Me and the Holy Spirit, we just be chatting all day long. Just praying without ceasing. There are reverent times of prayer, but a fully yielded life will stay in the constant place of communion. And then we'll ebb back to the unseen, underpraised place, the hidden place the place of intimacy, just as a husband and wife would remove themselves into privacy, so too to know God and be known by him, you have to be willing to be obscure, to pull back, because there has been no work of witchcraft, no work of manipulation, no assault of the adversary that God has not given me victory over first in the hidden place, in the spirit realm, so that you can go out and be effective for the kingdom of God. We're over time. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. I know y'all are hungry. Me too. The Kiddushin period, the period of preparation is so powerful. That's where, in accordance with Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, he does this to present to himself a bride that is a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any other blemish, instead holy and without fault. Do you remember the parable of the 10 bridesmaids, five foolish, five wise? That is a picture of the church. That's not the non-believers and the believers. I'm gonna punch somebody in the gut, but it has to be said. They were bridesmaids. They were, had engaged in the betrothal, they were awaiting the bridegroom's return. But five were foolish in that when he was delayed, they didn't have enough oil in their lamp. Five were wise because they did have enough oil. So when he came in the midnight hour, they were ready. They'd engaged in the Kiddushin process. You can't inherit your grandma's oil. You can't inherit your dad's oil. You can't inherit your pastor's oil. The oil of the Holy Spirit that keeps our flame burning in this crazy culture, in this wild time, as we move towards the bridegroom's return, the oil that will keep your lamp burning is cultivated in the hidden place. It's pressed out just as it came like blood, sweat of blood with Jesus in Gethsemane, where he said, you your will done, not my own. It's that place where the oil is pressed out in our life and we remain ready and we're able to declare in hope, not like, well, I hope it happens. Hope biblically meant confident assurance. Yes. We wait in hope. I know my bridegroom's coming for me. 
I know every element has been fulfilled perfectly and my bridegroom is returning. The word of God says that if anyone tries to deceive you and say that Christ is not returning just as he departed in the flesh, they are a liar. We wait like aliens, like sojourners in this world to fulfill the work needed in the time, to know the equipping and the intimate place and with the confident assurance of the lion of Judah is coming. He first came like the lamb, but my bridegroom is coming and I will be ready. My lamp is burning. That if this word is stripped from us at some point or another, okay, I've got it written on my heart. Because now while we're up in our cushy homes and our fancy cars, we aren't neglecting consuming of the bread of life while it's easy. I probably need to leave the stage. I really am about to speak in tongues and run a lap, and some of y'all are like, (laughs) what is the caduceus? I actually had your pastors or your team this time put up the elements, um, like the parts, because I will move so fast and stay stuff, and then I'd have someone come up like, could you tell me more about the caduceus? That's where you lost me. I'm like, oh, the caduceus. We should should rewind. I went kind of fast. No, 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 it's so beautiful, it's so powerful. And the the ninth part of this whole process is the bridegroom's return and the wedding feast of the lamb. I don't know about you, but I will be ready. I pray we are a church made ready. I pray we are a church that has a reservoir of oil. I pray we are a church that is not scared in these times, but recognizes that we are here for such a time as this, that actually the church of God, we are the ones on the offense, pushing back, the, the, the kingdom of darkness, that the gates of hell cannot prevail against the spirit of the living God. We act so often like, oh my goodness, and the demonic and the unclean spirit and the wicked of the world. Guess what? You hold all authority in Christ Jesus. And if you will allow him to transform you in righteousness when no one is looking because you've received of the bridegroom and, and you say, I'm a beloved bride. Every part of the process is being carried out in this Kiddushin process. I will engage with the Spirit of God. I won't quench it. I won't run from it. I won't deny it. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. If you will know the place of intimacy with the bridegroom and receive of his love for you in the hidden place, you will come out as a bride that is effective in reaching those who are hurting, who are lost, who are deceived. And he wants us effective, church. But that doesn't begin with just give me the gifts and give me the microphone and give me the stage. No, it begins with give me holiness. Convict me in every way that's needed. Renew my mind. I break every word curse spoken against me. I ask that you would take old mindsets, uproot them in all of their bad fruit. I break every soul tie, every sinful connection point that is affecting my mind, my will, my emotions. Heal me, Lord. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come as you have been poured out for this Kiddushin period that we would be able to receive of you by faith and you would be able to bring to completion that which Christ began in us and in the body as a whole. Lord, I pray that you would give people revelation of their identity as bride and greater revelation of your identity as bridegroom. Let every wound of the relational variety, let it bend a knee and bow to the name of Yeshua, to Jesus. Lord, transform us from the inside out as we have revelation of your love, your steadfast love, let us abide in you and wait with confident assurance for your return. The harvest is ripe. Let the workers not be few, but let those workers not be working with selfish ambition or vain conceit, but effective in their work because they've yielded their lives to what the master orders, what the king decrees, what the bridegroom delights in partnering with his bride in. 
Thank you, Lord, for healthy intimacy and the invitation to know you. We love you and we trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Yeah, let's give it up for him. Such a great message. We're so honored to have Mo with us today to kick off our series, Preach It. Uh, go out to her table in the lobby uh, after you leave today. Uh, support their ministry. And uh, she has books available out there, and today they're free. So go out there, get one of her books, um, and thank you so much to her for her generosity in doing that for us. If you have a prayer need of any kind, please come forward after the service. Our prayer partners will be down front. They're ready to pray for you, pray with you. And also, if you came prepared to give today, you can do so one of three ways. They're on the screen behind me. We would love for you to partner with us in uh, taking the life-changing message of Jesus to this community every week. Hope you guys have a wonderful week this week, and we'll see you next Sunday for week two of Preach It.